Thanks everybody um, for your slide as a tax professional. I guess this is your full room. Uh, here we go. Um, so what I'm going to look at is uh, some of the tax reliefs across the innovation lifecycle for R&D uh, companies, be it a startup uh, or whether it's if it's a larger company, if it's the life cycle of a um, R&D project in the BDO take a very much uh, life cycle approach to uh, you know financing R&D and release because we're late. Introduce myself, my name is Derek Henry. I'm a tax partner and I head up the Ormond Tax Services team. Within that team, we cover all innovative tax reliefs, uh, including the new knowledge development box. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail into um, we say the RD or the knowledge development box. I'm going to go to high level through all the tax reliefs that we will look at. Um, BDO, we're, we're a large accountancy firm. We also have uh, a couple of funding. Uh, departments, corporate finance, we have uh, the EIS department which uh, specializes in raising funds for um, companies to go into an EIS fund which we administer. We also have a development capital fund. So, uh, as I say, we, we very much look at um, tax supports across the life cycle of, um, of an ordinary project or a company. So, from the inception of, of the project to um, the actual exit through to, uh, from maturity from to development and growth. And uh, there's a number of stages in the life cycle. And what, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to maybe overlay a case study in terms of a startup's journey from the beginning of an entrepreneur's all the way up to um, maturity and exit. And I'm going to overlay the tax reliefs on that. So you may be familiar with this um, concept of the value of debt uh, um, down at the bottom here. And it's, it's kind of when you get to your first revenue stage, there's some pre seed funds that are available. But it's getting through that can be where a lot of projects fall and a lot of projects fall. Once you get through that and you start making good revenue, then typically you can get to maturity and there's plenty of supports for that. So um, we'll come back to this slide at the end with an overlay of some of the tax supports on that. Just to introduce you to our entrepreneurs, we've got Connor, Mary, Roshi and Matthew. Uh, they work for a large multinational, they work together. Uh, they've been there for 10 years, they've come up with an idea, and there's a lot of utility, so they decide to take that and set up on their own. Uh, each have about 60 grand of uh, capacity to invest in their new venture, however the business plan requires about 450 of funding. So what we need to do is look at the various um, reliefs and um, incentives to, to reduce the cost of that initial investment. So, uh, they incorporated Phoenix Limited uh, to, to undertake their, their, their operations. The first relief we look at up here is the start relief for entrepreneurs, or the sure relief for, for, uh, for sure. And basically this is an incentive for employees who are leaving employment and going to set up on their own to invest in their own companies. And what it does is it gives you a, a refund of your income tax for the prior six years now, there's a number of conditions you may you have to be mainly POE for the last four years, but it effectively allows you to take the money that you invest in the company and to claim your tax back for the previous six years in relation to that investment. Uh, it must be a qualifying trade and the investment must be via shares rather than the director's loan or anything like that. You must take on full-time employment with the new company. So that's the sure relief. Um, on the next one, which is Similar to the short relief, it's an investment relief again, but it's not restricted to people that go to that have left employment and you don't have a requirement to go and work in the company. So it's the EIS scheme. Um, you may have heard of it as the, the old BES scheme, it's the same thing, it was just rebranded a couple of years ago. And basically that's the business expansion scheme was different in 2010. It allowed companies to raise money to expand their business. The benefit to the company was that they could raise 5 million in any 12 month period or 50 million and it's up to those amounts. Um, 50 million is over the lifetime of the company. Um, it's an equity investment so from a company's perspective the benefit of that is that you can take on other funding sources as well and typically through our EIS fund what we find is that if you get it into an EIS fund the banks will support you as will Enterprise Ireland so a lot of our EIS investment companies, they would have got matching funding from the EI or they would have got bank funding on top of it. And they can do that because your gearing level is reduced. This investment is an equity investment. Um, if 
locks in that capital for four years because the investors, we're going to talk about the investors' relief in a minute, which is the other side of this, but the investor needs to stay within the company for four years or stay or hold their investment within the company for four years to pay the relief. So it is, uh, um, you know, as I say, it triggers additional funding. There's just a, a, a couple of companies that, that would have availed the EIS at various stages in their life cycle. EIS has, I suppose, two uh, places on the life cycle of the company. You can do it as a startup, and you can get your EIS certification from the revenue, and then you can go to your investors and say, look, here, here's an investment opportunity, here's the business plan, and by the way, whatever you get in, whatever you put into it, there's tax relief for you day one. Even if I don't get you in return, you've got your tax relief. So that's the benefit of the company. And the, the, these companies may have started that way, all the friends and family offered that way. As they became more established, then they can approach one of the EIS funds, which, as I said, we 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 run a 12 million fund, which uh, invests 12 million each year of investor money into a diverse portfolio of companies. If you're a more mature company and you have a track record of serving two, three years, you could potentially qualify for that fund. And that means that you don't have to go and look for the investors. Instead, you come to the fund and you say, I'm going to raise this money, you give your business plan. Once you get approval, then the investors are there for you because the investors invest in the fund rather than your company. And it's a diverse fund from the investor's perspective. So that's from the company's perspective. From the investor's perspective, the benefit is that it's, it's a 40% income tax hit, or sorry, relief on um, your investment. So if you invest 100 grand in a company, you get 40,000 40, back uh, before you get any return from the company. And you get that over two, uh, two tranches, 30% the year you invest, and then 10% in the fourth year. So that's the lock-in period. Um, and you know to, to, to get that additional 10%, you need to, hit the, sorry, the company needs to have increased its employees, or it must have increased its spend on R&D. So um, that's very attractive because you sell your business case to your investors, and let's say it could be friends or family, and you say, look, you get your, your income tax relief back, and then all you have to do is get them 60% plus, and they've got a return on their investment. It's an all income relief. You can get up to 150 grand per annum um, uh, from your tax relief. And to be qualified individually, you must be tax resident and paying income tax in Ireland. So that's just from the investor perspective. Again, some more companies that would have availed of this throughout the years uh, to help grow their business. Um, so if we apply that then to our entrepreneurs, uh, the four entrepreneurs, they claim the show relief for the last six years, over the last 10 years they've, they've been uh, working. So they invest 100 grand each with a net cost of 60 grand to them. Um, so that gets them 400 grand in the, of the four, 450 that they require, which, uh, which helps. They then get outline approval from EIS, uh, or outline EIS approval from revenue, and then that gives them uh, an additional benefit to offer to their, their friends and family or angel investors, and they raise another 50,000. So that gets them their 450,000 um, investment uh, for their startup. They then go into uh, the development phase. So they hire nine engineers uh, to carry out their R&D, and in the first three years, they have the following uh, trading results. So they have an R&D cost of um, 450,000, and they, they have profits over the various years uh, increasing to 750,000 in year three. So at this stage in, 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 um, in the cycle, what you're looking at is, one, you're trying to reduce the cost of the investment in the R&D, and then you're trying to reduce any tax costs on the profits. Um, so what we look at there in the first instance is the R&D tax credit. So there's been a lot of speakers that have spoken in detail. Uh, my, my colleagues spoke from an engineer's perspective in terms of what's qualifying criteria from an R&D perspective. I'm just going to focus on the tax side, but we are there if anyone wants to know from a, a technical qualification side, from the science side. The benefits from a tax perspective, it's a 25% credit. That 25% credit is on top of the 12.5% tax deduction that you will get through your normal corporation tax return. So that's an effective tax saving at 37.5%. And the big benefit is that it's cash refundable. So even if you don't have taxable profits that you need to use, or you, you need the credit to shelter, you can get a refund of that tax. And, I, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in, in a second. The key thing is that that 25% is of, of the costs of your R&D. So your main driver is going to be your salary costs. And they can ramp up very quickly. So 
even at a very startup stage, you can get quite a big benefit from your R&D tax credit, and then all the way through to uh, maturity, when you're doing iterations of your product that can qualify for your R&D tax credit. So it is the most valuable tax relief credit available for corporates that's on the, on the, the legislation. Using the credit, as I say, it is refundable, but it, you use it first against your corporation tax liability, and then you get into the refund mechanism. So if we look at year one, what we do is we, we work out our tax credit, we throw it against our corporation tax liability for year one. This will give you year one excess. That year one excess, then you can put it back against your prior year corporation tax liability, and if you still have some more year one left after that, you get one third of that paid uh, in, in that year one period. You carry the forward, the, the balance to year two, use it against your corporation tax liability in year two. Again, if there's a year one excess after you've done that, you get 50% of that refund in year two, and the same to year three to get you uh, the balance refunded by year three. So over that three year period, you've either used the R&D tax credit against your tax liability, or you've got it to be paid to you. So it is uh, a benefit to all companies. There is some limits in there in terms of uh, your salary and payroll costs, but unless you've got a large capital spend, you typically won't hit them. The next relief is the startup camp, uh, exemption for uh, new companies, and effectively this is a, an exemption from corporation tax for your thir first three years of, of uh, trading. If you have a CT liability of less than 40,000, you do need uh, to have eight employees because it's linked to your PRSI contributions, which are maxed out at five grand. So uh, there can be a cap, but there is uh, the legislation change in recent so you can carry it forward. I'm sure a bit of time, so I'll just run through very quickly through. If we apply those two reliefs to our entrepreneur's journey, uh, without the reliefs, we would have expected a tax liability of 12.5% of 150,000. By applying these reliefs, over the various years, and I won't go into the detail, but effectively your startup, uh, your credit in the first year, and then into your startup exemption. We reduce our tax liability to zero. We get a cash refund of the credit of 6,488, and actually a bit more, 63 as well. And we have this carry forward that we can use against corporation tax liability of 76 grand. So it's a big swing for a startup company from a potential 150 grand of a liability down to uh, carry forward of, of 76 to their benefit. We then look at our um, the, the journey from exploitation and growth. Um, at this stage, the company um, continues to expand. In year five, it buys a specific piece of intangible asset that it requires for its development. Uh, it spends another million internally developing that asset to the, to the commercial use that they want. And then from year five to ten, the software yields profits of uh, 15 million. So at this stage, what we're trying to uh, do is one, get a tax deduction for the cost of the technology that we bought in, and reduce our tax liability on this 15 million of profit. So what we would look at then is uh, our specified intangible asset relief. So this is section 291A relief from, from the legislation, and it, effectively it's a tax uh, depreciation on the cost of any intangible asset, which is, you know, it's, it's trademarks, goodwill, it's, it's quite a broad definition that's under 291A. So that would give you a 12.5% reduction on your costs, which can be used against your, your tax uh, taxable profits. The, the 15 million of profit then, how we try to reduce that is probably through our knowledge of the box. We have a qualifying asset um, and we can then, we've, we've, we've developed that through R&D so we can get into, instead of a 12.5% rate of tax, we get into the knowledge of the box which gives us a 6.25% rate of tax. It's quite a complicated calculation behind the knowledge of the box, I'm not going to dwell on it now, it's been covered uh, earlier today, but just a summary of the relief is that you must be carrying on R&D. That R&D must result in a qualifying asset, which is going to be a patent for copyright software. Uh, there is a small company's certification. Um, it's it's a similar to a patent, but it's not publicly publicly disclosed. Um, that's your qualifying asset. You must have trading income from that qualifying asset, and then you get your knowledge development box allowance, which gives you an effective tax rate of 6.25% instead of 12.5%. So if we look at that in practice, we have profits of 15 million. Um, we've reduced our taxable profits through the specified intangible asset relief of 500,000, which is the piece of software or IP that we bought. So that reduces our profits, and then we get our KDB relief, which reduces our profits by a further 5.5 million. 
We also get the earning tax credit at the same time on the million of spend that we spent on, this, on the, the asset to get it to commercial. And that gives us a total tax saving of uh, 944,000. So instead of 2 million tax, we've got it down to 1.1. So then the exit piece, um, so if we, if we follow that journey again, we've gone through our, our exploitation and our development. We now move on, it's year five, uh, and we're back to entrepreneurs. The company's worth 2 million. Mary's 55 and wants to exit the business. Um, she holds her shares directly, and it's worth 500,000 in year five. So we'll come back to that. It then rolls forward another few years, and the, the, the other two of the other three investors are looking at their position. And in year 15, the business is now worth 40 million. Connor's age 48 and wants to exit. He holds his company to a, to a, to a personal company. Roisin's 50 and she wants to exit the business. Like Mary, she holds the shares directly in Phoenix. And then Matthew, our last engineer, is 55, and he wants to take full control of the business because he sees it passing on to his next generation. So on the exit, the relief, what we're looking for is, again, to reduce the cost of that exit. And there's three mechanisms typically you will look at. One is the holding company exemption. If you hold shares in a company through a holding company, so uh, a holding company is any company that has 5% of the shares in its subsidiary. If you uh, have that structure, you can sell this operation pool here tax-free to that company, to the holding company, which means you can get your, your proceeds gross into the holding company uh, free of tax. You do need to extract the funds out of Holco if you want to take them personally, but it is a very strong mechanism if you want to reinvest um, into business because you can now drop down another operating company from the holding company and then fund that through the uh, proceeds of the disposal. Uh, the next one is a, is a new relief that was introduced. It's an entrepreneur's relief. And this is where you sell a company that you've, you've owned for more than three years. And instead of paying the normal capital gains tax rate of tax at 33%, you have a reduction to 20%. There's a 1 million lifetime limit on that. It was only introduced in 2016, and the business must be owned for three years, so you won't see that going through to 2020 for the, the three years. You must have had a 5% share only, you must have been 50% of your time in the company. That compares unfavorably to the UK regime. The UK regime, which is pretty much the exact same, gives you a 10% grade and your lifetime limit is 10 million. So we have a bit to go on that. But the final relief that we look at on an exit is then your retirement relief. So to, retirement relief again is a CGT relief, so it's a disposal of your, your capital shares. And what you're looking at here is you must be age 55 or over, um, and there, there's a number of qualifying criteria quite a complicated piece of legislation, but effectively, if you, get, if, if you qualify, you have uh, limited uh, tax-free amounts that you can get in, uh, on the disposal of your business. If, it's, if the disposal is to a third party, your tax-free amount is limited to 750,000 if you are aged between 55 and 60, 66, with some margin of relief after that. If you sell it for less than 500,000 uh, and you're plus 66 years, then that's the tax-free element there. If the disposal is to a child, you have a much more favorable relief. And effectively, if you're age 55 to 66, you can dispose of it unlimited to your child. So it doesn't matter what the market value of the company is, there's no tax on you on that disposal. Um, if you're over 66, then it's limited to 3 million that you can benefit from that. That was it. The, all these limits. Originally, there was no age limit. Once you're over 55, you got the 750. And if, in this case, if you're over 55, you got an unlimited. But uh, they changed it a couple of years ago because they were trying to encourage people to pass on their business to the next generation at a younger age. So that's where the 55 to 66 came in. The, the other side of the second one is that if you were if you're disposing to a child, you'd seek a capital acquisition tax relief for the child to reduce their gift from you by 90%, so that uh, the value of that gift by 90%, so that, that's just a corollary of that one. So let's apply that to our entrepreneurs. Uh, as we said, year five, Mary's 55, she's getting 500 grand of proceeds, so what we look at there is retirement relief, because she hasn't held her investment through a holding company. She's a CGT saving of 132,000, which is 500,000 minus her initial 100,000 investments, which is 400,000 per game, um, at 33%, so that's effectively she's made that disposal tax-free now.
because of returning the grade. We go forward to year 15. So Matthew's going to buy Connor's interest. Connor is uh, wants to get out, but Connor has been smart, so he's put a holding company between him and uh, Phoenix Limited. So therefore, Connor can sell his interest to Matthew without his holding company incurring any tax because he can avail of the holding company regime. Um, so now he's got 1.6 million, which is um, 15, uh, sorry, 40 million divided by three of them uh, at 33 percent. That's his saving because there's no CGT there. He will is free to invest that that, uh, that proceeds into his new ventures um, tax free. If he decides to take it out of his holding company, well then he's going to have uh, charged the tax on that that you would have to deal with. Roshin is fifty, so she doesn't require, um, doesn't qualify for retirement relief, and she has no holding company. So in this regard, we look at entrepreneur relief. Now she's selling for more than for, for more than one million, so we get the first million tax uh, a tax at twenty percent instead of thirty three. So that gives her one hundred thirty grand of saving on exit. Matthew is sixty five when he passes it to his son in year twenty five. We claim retirement relief on that again because he is below sixty six. We can claim it unlimited, so it doesn't matter what value the company is at that stage. His deemed disposal value will be a market value because it's to a related party. But that's looked look, look by because of retirement relief. Um, so he didn't know CG, CGT. His son would have a capital acquisition tax on his receipt of a gift, but we would reduce that value by 90%, and then that would be at 33%. So that's the business asset relief really for, for, for Rowan. So there, there are the various stages of the life cycle. And just to come back to this one, if we look at what we've done over the years to, to uh, avail of tax reliefs, so we've looked at the shore relief at the startup phase and the EIS private placement, which is to your friends and family. Uh, we've got the startup exemption in the first three years, which brings us through uh, to, to some profitability in the past year first revenue. Then we've looked at the R&D. The R&D is the most prevalent. It goes across the full life cycle. Effectively, even to maturity, where you're doing iterations of your product, you can more R&D tax credits. Uh, then the knowledge development box and the uh, 291A helps shelter taxable profits. So if that's available when you're in that um, maturity phase on your product or your company. EIS fund is a later stage investment uh, relief, which again, once you have that track record, you can get into. And then on exit, you look at the retirement relief, the entrepreneurial relief, and potentially the whole company exemption. So that's a very brief snapshot of the various reliefs that you can look at over the life cycle. So of, of a company or a, of a project. Um, I'll take any questions and answers now. We have a stand just behind us there, and uh, if it's on the r side, we have some engineers there as well, if it's a technical perspective, and if it's on the tax side, we uh, have to take any questions now or at the stand. Okay. Thank you very much.